tonight, I want to tell you a little bit about my secret life, which I haven't actually talked a lot about uh, outside of kind of family and friends. Uh, and that is that I'm a hunter. And I realize that when I say I'm a hunter, that means certain things to certain people in this room. And so before I go any further, just a couple of quick clarifications, if this works. There we go. All right. I'm not a trophy hunter. Uh, and and it's, that's important for me to let you know because um, I uh, eat what I kill and I believe that that's what we should be doing when we're hunting. Um, I hunt because I want to feed my family healthy organic meat that I know where it came from. And I hunt because I'm human. And hunting has, um, has pushed me to my physical, emotional, mental extremes. And, and through that process, through, through all of that, has allowed me to discover more about who I am as a, as a human being. I also believe that uh, in some of us, the act of hunting, the, the pursuit of things is actually ingrained in, in human nature. Um, and so that's what I mean when I say that I think hunting is something that's quite human. Uh, I'm also an architect. And, so, and, and since, I was, since I'm a, uh, I was a little kid, I had this fascination, I guess, with how things are put together um, and how buildings are put together and then how those things turn into these magical spaces that have an impact on the communities that we live in. And so I've had the good fortune of being involved with all sorts of designs, everything from uh, children's playhouses um, to large scale kind of community recreation and public buildings and stuff. Um, and it's been, that's been the other big part of my life. But up until now, there's been kind of this very clear distinction between Paul the architect and Paul the hunter. There was Paul the architect who lived in the city and did kind of doodling stuff with buildings. And then there was Paul the hunter who kind of walked up and down mountains and, and shot stuff. And, and those two things were kind of very much in opposition with each other. And I think partly because there's also as kind of our world urbanizes and we all kind of move to cities, there's been a growing disconnect between those who live in cities and those who live outside of cities. Uh, and that manifests itself in all sorts of ways, but one of them is kind of a growing disconnection with where our food comes from. Um, it's also meant that hunting hasn't necessarily been seen in a, in a positive light over the past 20 to 30 years. Mark made me carry that thing all the way down Hastings Street. <laughs> you have no idea the looks that you get when you carry something like that down, down Hastings Street in broad daylight. But I was kind of caught in this, in this tension of, of these two things that were really big passions in my life and not really understanding how I could make those two things uh, one or, or make them at least talk to each other. Um, and then I started to understand something. And, and I think it's kind of very much in the spirit of what we're doing here tonight, which is that when you have two opposite things, there's actually something quite beautiful and magical when you start to allow those things to influence each other. And so I set out on a, on a journey to, to discover how uh, Paul the architect could become influenced by Paul the hunter and uh, started kind of just thinking about how that would happen. So I want to talk to you tonight about three things uh, that I've learned from hunting about architecture. The first, uh, comfort is relative. So um, I hunt a lot with my dad, that's him right there. He's 60 years old and he still climbs up and down mountains with me, which is fantastic. And this is in northern BC, we were hunting caribou. And this, this, this plateau was, was a super hostile place for people. It was a place where the wind was literally so strong, you could barely walk into it. You couldn't even really talk or breathe into, when you're facing into the wind. It was, it was, it was cold, it was, the weather was crazy, and, and the wind. And it certainly wasn't a place that was a, a comfortable place for, for a human being to be in. Now you look at something like this and you see kind of a fairly sort of modest, kind of scruffy looking group of trees. And I don't think anybody here in the room would say that that's necessarily a comfortable place to be. But in that place and in that time, that was everything that we needed. That was comfort for us. That was the Taj Mahal. Because you're, you're there and it gives, you, it gives you shelter from the wind and you kind of tuck yourself under the branches, get up from the rain. It gives you that sense of protection and that was all we needed. And so when it comes to architecture, the interesting thing is that we tend to think about buildings as you're either inside them or you're outside them. You're either comfortable inside or you're not comfortable outside. But wouldn't it be so much better if we thought of our buildings with a broader range of experience of what it means to be inside or outside? This is the, uh, the law courts downtown by the late Arthur Erickson, which is a phenomenal building. And you open the front door and you go inside and you're under this huge glass roof. And it's not very a warm space. There's no heating in that space. But you're out of the rain. And when it pours in Vancouver in the middle of winter 
and you're underneath that big kind of sheet of glass with the water just kind of cascading down. It's one of the most Vancouver spaces that I've ever been in. And then you go into kind of the warmer spaces on the inside where it's structured and kind of normal and, and, all, and all of that. And it's, such, it's so much more of a rich experience as a building that we offer to the community. So comfort is relative. The second thing, humans behave like animals. So I am, I am completely qualified to make this statement because I have three young boys under the age of eight. <laughs> and they are animals, I kid you not. Um, this is a place where we go mule deer hunting every year. That's where that, that came from. Um, we go there every fall. And the interesting thing about this is that the deer in this area, they actually hang out in very specific places in this ecosystem. And it happens to be the place, the intersection between two different things. Uh, the, you've got the fir timber on the right that gives them shelter. And you've got the open grasslands on the left. That's where they, that's where they, they eat and they feed. And they love those kind of boundary zones between two things. That's the richest zone of biodiversity you find is when two ecosystem systems meet. And so that's where, that's where we find animals. That's where we, that, those are the places we target because they have very specific structural char characteristics around how, how life kind of is fostered there. And the interesting thing is, is that humans actually respond in a very instinctual way in the same way that animals do to the built environment. And if we study animals and the way they react, we actually learn more about how humans will react to the built environment and to, and to space. This is the um, Life Sciences Center out at UBC, which had this huge, they invested in this huge, big uh, atrium space right in the middle of the building. And I think, I think the concept here was that it was sort of this, gonna be this thriving social hub of activity thing. But when they opened the building up, uh, they put three rows of chairs and tables right down the middle. And within a week, all of those tables and chairs had been moved right to the edge. Because nobody wants to be in the middle of a fishbowl with everybody looking at you. You don't feel safe. Your back is exposed. So if we think about this stuff, when we build buildings, they're going to be so much better for the people that actually live in the buildings, which, which I happen to think is a good idea. The last thing is that hunting connects us, and so does architecture. Um, this is uh, the town of Vals in an alpine valley in Switzerland. And a few years ago, an architect named Peter Zumthor built a, a phenomenal building there. Um, it's a thermal bath, it's a spa. And you go there and he, and he studied the local building techniques when he, was, when he was designing this building and he kind of, he buried it into the slope the same way that the barns in the area were buried in and he used a locally quarried stone and abstracted it and really brought its texture and beauty out. And when you go into this space, you come out from that and you, and you feel that stone and you sit there and you look through the valley, uh, through these portals of stone. You come away from that building having understood more about what that place is. And I guess that's the, that's the thing that fascinates me about architecture is it has the ability to kind of extract the DNA of a place and then give it to you as an experience that we can all share. And I think it's a, that's a wonderful thing. This building was so important to the Swiss people that um, a year after it opened, they put it on the Heritage Registry. <laughs> Hunting, I think, can do the same thing in a, in a, in a different way. Um, several years ago, my, my father and I, we had uh, the opportunity to hunt mountain goats in uh, northern BC. And hunting goats is, is a tough business. You're up and down mountains all day long. You're dealing with crappy dehydrated food. You're dealing with bears. You're dealing with weather and all, and all the rest of that stuff. And so we were at the, at the very end of kind of our, our rope, so to speak. We got to the end of the trip. We hadn't shot a mountain goat yet. And so we, we made one last push and we climbed that one last mountain on the last day. And we actually found the mountain goat that we were, that we were pursuing. And, and we got it. And this is the part of my talk, to be honest, that I, I don't really know how to speak about because it's a, it's a difficult thing. Um, when you, hunting at some point involves the taking of a life. And I don't know, quite know how to put that into words, but it's such an integral part of that whole process. And I guess when you, when you walk up to the animal that you've, that you've taken, and there's this kind of, this incredible range of emotions that goes through you. And, um, you know, when, you're, when you go up to it and you put your hands on it and you realize, you know, all of the adrenaline that's been coursing through your veins from the, from the pursuit, all, you're, you're so tired, you're so physically exhausted and tired, you're euphoric at having finally gotten what you came for, and then at the same time, you put your hand on that animal and there's this incredible sadness that kind of washes over you. And I don't know how to reconcile those feelings, but I do know that in that time and in that place, I feel so deeply connected to that place, to the land, 
It's just unlike any other experience that I've had. It's almost like hunting gives me the opportunity to step back and become, uh, it takes me from being a, a passive observer to an active participant in, in the land. It's almost like we've, we've been able to take, take our place in this ancient sort of ritual, this ancient order of things and how, how it's unfolded for, for so many years in the natural world. And that's, that's how hunting connects me to, to place, connects me to the natural world. So my name is Paul, and I'm an architect, and I'm a hunter. Thank you. Thank you.